Conference Pastor Stephen Cabaldo from uh, Echad Unity Ministries in New York City. Uh, I've been teaching recently on uh, some of the smaller prophetic books to see what uh, lessons we can get from them about discipling and witnessing and our relationship with God. And uh, there, there's some interesting principles coming out today. I will uh, be teaching the book of Jonah, which is another short book. But before we do that, uh, let's just give thanks to our Father. Thank you, Father for being with us for another day and giving us another opportunity to to learn and study and uh, apply your word. Uh, watch over us, watch over uh, and edify the people who will be listening to this message, watch over our families, help us all glorify you and your son in his name. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so the book of Jonah is uh, another interesting picture of someone who had kind of a kind of an up and down relationship with God is really the, I think the way I would put it, is that uh, uh, he was a believer, but you know, he had these moments of uh, thinking that, you know, maybe God should be doing something else, or why was he being asked to do something. So we'll just go through this and just uh, uh, bring out some principles. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. It's known, I think, almost as kind of a fairy tale, because uh, Jonah was in the whale of the belly, which actually biblically was a, was a fish. Uh, I think if you want to understand it in a more you know, metaphorical or spiritual way, he was in adversity for three days and three nights. He was in uh, some kind of hell, some kind of mental agony, some type of personal tribulation that he was going through. And he was really, uh, really, I think the main point here is that he was struggling in his relationship with God. And we all do that, you know, we've had, uh, we all have moments when we don't, uh, we don't understand why we're being asked to do things. Uh, why certain things happen and you know this past week and weekend uh, you know in our in our lives we've had some very uh, uh, difficult but interesting situations uh, on both sides of the family and different things have happened and uh, in one case it looks like there's going to be some kind of a positive uh, positive outcome or positive resolution of what that situation was in the other case uh, I'm not so sure what time will tell but these are the things that happen uh, in the walk with God as the things come up. And you have, you, 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 have uh, you wonder sometimes, why does God allow certain things? Why does he put you through, through certain things? Why does he uh, you know, want you to deal with certain things? And I think Jonah was a bit uh, like that. But, so I think he's not, uh, it, it's not a bad study because in a way it does represent every believer who truly wants to live in Christ and walk in the word and who uh, deals with these, uh, comes up with difficult situations and just wants to turn around and go the other way, basically, but that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to confront, confront with love, but to confront the difficult situations that face us. And this is what we've tried to do this week in our situations, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it is, it, it is uh, difficult. Um, you know, if you believe you're telling the truth, uh, you're gonna see that the truth offends. Anyway, Jonah, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to that great city Nineveh, cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So basically this was the job that was given to Jonah. He was supposed to be a, uh, a missionary, basically. He was supposed to go as a man of God. He was supposed to go to Nineveh and uh, tell them that they needed to repent from their wicked ways. And, uh, you know, ne never a popular message, you know, when you're in a city uh, like this, Nineveh was uh, its current day Iraq, but apparently it was a, it was a large and fairly, you know, prosperous, uh, well-to-do city by the world standards, and uh, they were not attentive to God, they were not paying attention to God. But this is where God wanted uh, Jonah to go, and uh, so that, that was the assignment, you know, like they used to say on the old Mission Impossible, your assignment, should you choose to accept it? Well, he, was, he really chose not to accept it at the beginning. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish, which uh, by all accounts, it's in southern Spain, by most accounts. By some accounts, it might be in northern Africa, but at, at, at any rate, I think if you, can, if you can imagine it geographically, you can get the picture. He was told, go, you know, X number of miles east, and he went X number of miles west. So he went in the in the diametrically opposed in the opposite direction of of god so you can look at that in the spiritual sense you could look at that simply in a physical natural geographical sense that god said do a and jonah decided to do b or the opposite of a but jonah rose up to flee to tarshish from the presence of the lord and went down to joppa and he found a ship going to tarshish so he paid the fare and went down to it 
to go with them to Tarshish from, from the presence of, of the Lord, to go from the presence of the Lord, where the Lord was and wanted him. Jonah said, no, sorry, can't do it, not available. Out to lunch, gone fishing, away for the summer, whatever you want to call it. But the Lord cast a great wind to the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken. Then the sailors were afraid, and each man cried to his God, and cast out the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it. So uh, this, this is Lord, the Lord's answer. It's, uh, and you know, people, maybe they view that as punishment, but it's really, it's, it's, it's accountability. You know, Jonah was, was given a task. Uh, he was given something to do by God, and uh, he chose to do something else. So of course there are consequences, there are results of that. But Jonah had gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay down, and he was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Get up, call upon your God. May it be that God will think about us and we will not perish. So all of the others, they, they were not believers in the Lord God. They were crying out to their gods, and they were trying to do things, you know, to alleviate their situation, like, you know, lighten the ship, things like that. You know, it's, uh, you know maybe we can get there if uh, maybe we won't sink so fast that we can make the ship not weigh as much. And everyone said to his fellow, to his mate, come and let us cast lots so we can know who is causing this evil for us. So, so there it is, we cast lots, you know, we don't pray, we, we do something which is really in a way kind of superstitious so we can know who is causing this evil for us. You know, this is, this is not, these are not the thoughts of God. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah, it's his fault. Then they said to him, tell us, we pray, who brought this evil upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So Jonah takes it both ways. You know, he's get he's getting it from God because he disobeyed. And he's getting it from the people who don't believe in God anyway. Uh, uh, you know, they're they're angry at him because he thinks uh, they think that Jonah is responsible for the problem. And he said to them, "I am a Hebrew, and I revere the Lord, the God of heaven, who has made the sea and the dry land." Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, "Why have you done this?" and asking Jonah why he did it, and that's that. there's a bit of irony there. I mean, Jonah didn't really do it. There was an action with a consequence, but, you know, the, the Lord is enforcing the consequence. For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. So these same people who don't believe in the Lord, they're now finding fault with Jonah that he left the Lord's presence, and now it's, uh, you know, it's just too bad for them. So there's, a, there, there, there's so much deception and irony in, 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 in what's going on here. But, he, uh, they knew that he had fled uh, from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what will we do to you? So the sea will be calm for us. And the sea grew more and more tempestuous. So, you know, me, 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 me. What, what will we do to you? What are you going to do so that things will be better for us? And he said to them, Jonah did, take me up and throw me into the sea so the sea will be calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is for my sake, it's because of me. So, you know, Jonah is thinking, well, if you just offer me up as a sacrifice, you know, God will have pity on you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Then they cried to the Lord and said, We beseech you, Lord, we beseech you. Now, let us not perish for this man's life, and do not lay innocent blood upon us, for you, Lord, have done as it pleased you. So now there's all of a sudden the conversion, you know, and that, don't we do that so often as we seek out God, we seek out God, you know, when we're in trouble, and we're, 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 we've all done that, I've done it, I'm sure you've done it, it's just something that's, it's because we're human, you know, we operate in the flesh, and we go along, uh, you know, a certain way, and uh, everything's fine, and then all of a sudden we have a problem, and then all uh, you know, it's God, 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 and, you know, going back to church and this and that. And I, I think what God really wants, what he really desires is genuine love for him and actions motivated by that love so that you don't just pray or go into church or seek God uh, just when you're in trouble. Develop a steady, you know, calm relationship with him. Let him put you through the afflictions. You know, there are, there's a momentary light, light affliction. That's in the scripture. So let him put you through that. Let him bring you through that. Uh, with his grace and with his his uh, prosperity and with his divine solutions, and instead of this kind of you know back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know I'm in, I, I'm into God, I'm not into God, I believe in God, I don't believe in God. Believe in God, trust God, have faith in God, and because you trust and have faith, obey God, 
and know that there will be some momentary light afflictions and that he will bring you through them. It's the back and forth thing, you know, you create some kind of a split personality or uh, I guess the Bible calls it double-minded uh, view of, uh, of Christ and, and the mind of Christ and, and, and what you're to do uh, in, in your relationship with God. So they took Jonah and cast him into the sea, you know, over the edge you go, mate, and the sea ceased from its raging. So this, uh, this worked. Then the men revered the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And that's, that, that's so typical of us, right? To know the way to be, oh yeah, just if you do this, uh, if you get me out of this, you know, I'll do this, I'll do that. That's not really what God wants. God might or he might not spare you from something like this. Uh, but it's, he doesn't want this type of, you know, up and down relationship. He wants a constant, steady relationship. He doesn't want all talk and only when you're in trouble. He wants uh, actions and he, want, he wants consistency, the way he's consistent. He wants his children, he wants his people to be consistent with him. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, simple enough like uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, on three days and three nights after he was crucified, right? In the belly of the fish. So, you know, uh, people love to talk about things like, did this really happen? Well, maybe it did. I mean, that's, uh, that's fine. I, I have no problem to say it happened. Uh, there's also another meaning here that the, the belly of the fish was his adversity, his, his affliction that he had to go, to go through. It kind of symbolizes hell in the sense of mental agony. I mean, he was not in hell, but he was in mental agony because he had this kind of schizophrenic split personality uh, relationship with, uh, with God. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried for myself to the Lord by reason of my affliction, and he answered me. Oh, I cried, and you, God, you heard my voice. For you had thrown me into the deep, into affliction, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All your billows and your waves passed over me, all the, 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 the trials and tribulations, the, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the, 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 the tumult, the noise, the distractions, the problems, uh, you know, people doing this and saying that and making stuff up and all kinds of things, all that stuff passed over him. And the, the, the crew, the crew of this ship, I mean, they were saying all kinds of terrible things about Jonah. You know, oh, you believe in God and, the, and God let this happen to us, you know, so we're going to take it out on you. And then Jonah's thinking God wants to take it out on me as well. So it's, uh, th this is what happens when you have this kind of uh, unstable relationship with God. God wants you to love him consistently as he loves you consistently. And, and, and Jonah is in the process of finding this out. He's a, this, is, this is a big learning experience for Jonah, and I think it's a big learning experience for all of us who go through different uh, trials and tribulations. Then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I shall look again toward your holy temple. I will look to you, I will have faith in you, I will trust you. Uh, I will look to your holy temple, and, and temple also in uh, as, as an image of, of the mind. I will look to the mind of Christ. I will look to the thoughts of Christ. I, I will think those thoughts, and I will have those motivations. The waters surrounded me even to my very life. So I thought I, I thought all of these uh, situations were going to kill me, not just the physical water, but uh, you know, just all of these trials and tribulations were going to kill me that I, I couldn't endure anymore. And, uh, you know, we, uh, many of us have had days like that to say, well, uh, you know, please, Lord, take me home, or, you know, just, uh, you don't want to live anymore. And that's, uh, that God doesn't want that. God wants you to enjoy the full life that you have in this stage when you have a physical body on planet Earth. He wants you to enjoy it. The waters surrounded me even to my very life. The depth closed all around me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Did you ever feel some days that you were just so confused, it looks like you had all kinds of, uh, like your brain was all tangled, and this is really what it is, the weeds were wrapped about my head, I just didn't know which way to think, I was just so confused about things. God is not the author of confusion, he doesn't want you, want you to be confused about uh, life and about your life with him. He wants you to have clarity, he wants you to have consistency, he wants you to have love, he doesn't want you to be uh, uh, bitter and accusing people of things and, and you know, saying things that, are, that you, know, you just spit out and maybe you don't even really mean them, but you say them anyway, and you hurt people. He doesn't want you to do that. 
I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bar bars was about me forever. So it's uh, it's like he would he had the feeling like he would never be able to get back to dry land. He would never be able to get back to that safe place, the place of refuge, the place that the Lord wants him to have. He has this feeling of desperation and hopelessness right now. And then um, the earth with her bars was about me forever, yet you have brought up my life from corruption, Lord my God. And here, from corruption. So there, so it, it, is, it isn't simply that I was in the water and now I'm on the land, fair enough, but my life from corruption. I had this corrupt way of thinking and behaving and being double-minded, and you tell me to go here and I go there, and you tell me to go there and I go here. This sense of rebellion. So he realizes that's corrupt, and that is, that is uh, uh, dishonest before the Lord, and he's, he's saying, you've brought up my life from corruption, Lord my God. When my life fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came into you, your holy temple. So he realized things got bad enough, life fainted within me. Now that's another sensation that we all have sometimes, is that, is that we feel like we're just ready to faint. We can't, we can't deal with a situation. We're in front of a situation that just is, is so difficult. Uh, it, it's almost like we think we'd be better off to lose consciousness so that we can deny it and not have to deal with it. Those who observe lying vanities forsake their own loving kindness. So if you pursue, as in the Book of Solomon, it talked about vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. If you pursue things that are vain, things that are not worth pursuing, and it isn't, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to have certain things, but He wants you to pursue Him first. If you're pursuing anything or anyone else uh, first ahead of God, then you're pursuing uh, something that is vain, a vanity. But I shall sacrifice to you, to God, with the voice of thanksgiving. Jonah says, I shall pay. That which I have vowed, whether it's money or something else, some other, uh, you know, whether it's just uh, in behavior or whatever it is, I shall pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So it's salvation, part one, and you can never lose it. You believe in Christ, and then part two, you live in Christ. That's your continuing, that's your salvation journey, that's the working out of your salvation with fear and trembling. You live in Christ. And the Lord spoke to the fish, yo fish, and it vomited out Jonah on the dry land. So uh, that was it. Uh, Jonah went through this terrible temptation of thinking he was going to die. And uh, he had to go through it for a certain period of time. And when you go through trials and temptations in your life, uh, there are different time lengths. You know, sometimes it's all over in a day, and sometimes it goes, over for f it goes on for a few days, and sometimes it goes on for weeks, months, years. I mean, there are different, there are different uh, seasons for different uh, trials. And uh, that's all up to the sovereign will and wisdom of God, you know, what we go through and for how long. And I think a lot of it depends on uh, your own ability to recognize what God is putting you through and to turn away from it, to repent from it, and to change your mind, change your thinking and, and uh, you know, go back to godly thinking. But uh, there are these different trials that there, there's no question God uh, does put people through. Jonah really, this was a trial that God allowed, but really it, this is more in the area of you reap what you sow. You know, Jonah deliberately made a decision to turn away from God, to go in exactly the opposite direction, literally and spiritually from the way that God had for him. God was calling him to a missionary journey to Nineveh, a very corrupt place, ungodly place, and uh, Jonah thought, well, you know, if God is loving kindness, he'll forgive them anyway, so, you know, I can, I can go hang out in Tarshish, I don't have to go to Nineveh. You know, maybe they have nice beaches in Tarshish, you know, whatever, I don't know, but he didn't want to go to Nineveh because it was going to be a tough job. And then finally he did go to Nineveh, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, a God of second chances, you, sometimes you've heard that one, Arise, idiot. Go to the great, I'm just teasing, go to the great city Nineveh and announce to it the declaration that I am speaking to you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city. And it was an exceeding great city, it was very prosperous. Of three days journey, three, and Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So, so uh, Jonah's bringing the message uh, you guys are toast, basically, in 40 days the city is going to be destroyed. So, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. And we've gone over these images before. I think it was the book of uh, Joel or one of the other uh, short prophetic books that, that I've been talking about recently. That uh, 
uh, where you know people were repenting, and so they proclaimed a fast, which uh, you know no eating and drinking, but a fast can be uh, from any kind of lust or you know anything that is not godly. You, you you fast from it, so it can be understood in different ways. And put on sackcloth as a sign of shame. Uh, from the greatest of them even to the least of them, so it didn't it didn't matter. They believed God. They believed God. So that was that was their their salvation. For word came to the king of Nineveh, and he got up from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. So even the king of Nineveh was so humbled by uh, the disobedience and the warning that even the king uh, participated in the same ritual. Uh, to show that he regretted uh, his own actions, that he felt shame, as uh, just like everyone else. So that shows, you know, God is no respecter of persons. The principle is right there, you know, and it's, uh, he says it, you know, in the New Testament, but here it is in the Old Testament, even the king. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Do not let either man or beast herd or flock, taste anything, do not let them eat anything or drink water, the fast. But every man and beast will be covered with sackcloth for their shame and cry mightily to God, cry out, repent. Yes, each one will turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. So really the thinking, the living, the actions, all that is not of God. And God, God wants, to, wants to act on us. He wants us to give him permission to act on us or not even uh, it's just what he wants for us I mean it's not we're not really such that we can actually give permission to God but I mean we can say we want to we, we want to trust and we, we want to have faith in God and he wants us to turn away from the evil way the thoughts and actions and to turn away from violence of the hands so he's after our hearts he's after our souls he's after uh, intellect, um, creativity, will, emotion—all of the all of the realms of human uh, human activity. You know, God God would like to guide us. You know, he would, he's he's asking us to let His Spirit guide us in all of the areas in which we function as humans. Who can tell if God will not turn and have compassion and turn away from His fierce anger, so we do not perish? So that's the nature and character of God. He doesn't want people to perish. He wants to give them a second chance. And God saw their deeds, that they turned away, from, they turned from their evil way, and God was sorry for the evil. He, he regretted that it happened and that it had to be that way, but they did repent. What he had said that he would do to them, God, he did not do. But, and Jonah's not done yet. He's got a little more rebellion in him, so God has to just kind of, kind of you know, take some sandpaper and sand off that rough edge. He's got a little bit more to go. We're almost done. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He was angry that, you know, that, uh, you know, God is letting these guys off the hook. He's letting them just get, get away with this because they said some cheesy prayer. No, no. God knew their hearts, and he knew that they were truly uh, struck by the fear of the Lord that in 40 days they would be destroyed, and they repented. And so God accepted that repentance. But that wasn't good enough for Jonah, and he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray you, Lord, that, you know, Christians see themselves as the good guys, and we want the bad guys taken down. Oh, they're all going to go to hell. And that's not what we should be hoping for. We should be hoping that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We shouldn't be trying to divide up into good guys and bad guys. That's not what we should be doing as Christians. And yet Jonah was doing this a bit here. You know, he was a believer, and he thought somehow that made him superior, and that these guys from Nineveh, they didn't deserve a second chance. But God gave them a second chance, and they repented. And if you were in that situation, you'd be very happy for God to give you a second chance. I, I know I would for myself. Therefore I fled before to Tarshish, for I knew that you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, and of great loving kindness, and regretful of the evil. Therefore now, Lord, take, I beseech you, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. See, he said, uh, you know, this is the the pity party. You know, uh, I didn't get my way. You know, you blew it, God. You know, I didn't want to live anymore. It's just he's feeling sorry for himself. You know, throw him in, throw me a pity party. Then the Lord said, "Are you very angry? Has life got you down, Jonah? You know, life's tough, isn't it? Are you very angry? You want to talk?" So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made a booth for himself and sat under it in the shadow until he could see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd 
and made it to come up over Jonah. And now whether this was for food or for shade, it was for some form of prosperity and protection for Jonah. And you can, again, you can, these, these images, you can, you know, you can look at them different ways. It's not a big deal. Just learn what you need to learn as a believer in Jesus Christ and apply it. God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah so it would be a shadow over his head to, de to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was really glad for the gourd. And when was the last time you were glad for a gourd? But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day. Some problem, some trouble, some test, something to attack the gourd. And it struck the gourd so it withered, like, you know, ate through it so it couldn't live anymore. And, uh, so that was the end of the gourd, right? And it happened when the sun did arise that God prepared a sultry east wind, so no more protection from the gourd, because we're bringing in the heat. And the sun beat upon Jonah's head, so he fainted, which he'd asked for before, so be, be careful what you pray for. He said he, he, his life was fainting, so now he faints. So he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, are you very angry for the gourd? Uh, that's kind of funny. That's almost a, that's a sense of humor, isn't it? I've got, who says God doesn't have a sense of humor? And he said, I'm very angry, even to death. This lousy gourd is basically a squash. It's a, you know, it's a pumpkin or something like that. And he's, he's angry even to death. And we sometimes overreact like that. We get angry even to death for the stupid, stupid things. And, you know, I, 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 you see it over and over again. And even we do it ourselves and, you know, we see other people do it. And, you know, he's all bent out of shape over a gourd. Over some small thing, he gets all, uh, all. He, he's he's ready to die. Then the Lord said, "You have had pity on the gourd, for which you have not labored, nor did you make it grow. It came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, in which there?" So God did recognize the greatness of Nineveh. Uh, that and basically, God is the source of all things, and He recognized the the uh, the creativity and the activity and the prosperity in which there are more than 120,000 people, now wouldn't that be worth it, of 120,000 people who come to the Lord, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. So they're, you know, they're lost too. And also many animals. So isn't it great to be able to save that city, 120,000 people and the animals don't die? And really that's the end of the chapter. It doesn't even have, we don't even get Jonah's response. Maybe he's going to go complaining more. We, we don't know. That's the end of the chapter. So Jonah is, uh, he's kind of a, he's a troubled believer. He's a double-minded believer. And he really, he, he really has problems when God is showing grace to other people because he thinks, you know, he did the right thing. And, you know, so he, he should be glorified and everybody else should be punished and not given another chance. So we don't want to be that way. I don't want to be that way. You shouldn't want to be that way. But it's it's a it's a very good uh, it's a very good uh, snapshot shot or profile of an Old Testament uh, uh, believer who who struggled and it's not to criticize or judge Jonah I struggle you struggle the point is not that we don't we all struggle but here it is and God has it here because He wants us to learn something from it so so that's my my hope and Father I do pray that uh, people will will learn and I will learn and others will learn uh, what the lessons are from this this great book of Jonah and how this 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 very dedicated man of God suffered in his own way and you know had to come to his own realization about certain things. So we bless this message to the edification of those who will hear it and we ask that you be with us and bless us this day. Watch over us and our families in Jesus' name we pray. Uh, amen. And just before I leave, uh, I will do John 3.16 in the different languages so you can think about that. And uh, if you meet someone that you might be able to witness to, uh, just bear in mind it doesn't really matter what their background is. It doesn't matter what their family background is. It doesn't matter if they've done things that are contrary to what society expects of them. Uh, that, you know, we, we have God's grace and mercy, uh, just like Nineveh did. And so, you know, we can, uh, we can cut people some slack. Not, not uh, we shouldn't be taken advantage of, but we should be available to uh, show mercy and grace. Uh, even if people don't live by the standards that that we have, you know, we, we really shouldn't be uh, seeing ourselves as superior to them. We should be uh, seeing these opportunities as chances to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so this is a, this is really uh, a great thing to make yourself available for as a believer in Jesus Christ. Porque uh, de tal manera amó Dios al mundo que ha dado a su hijo unigénito para que todo aquel que en él cree no se pierda, mas tenga, tenga vida eterna. Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son Fils unique, 
afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse point, mais qu'il ait la vie éternelle. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten or uniquely born son, so that everyone who believes in him would not die, but would have eternal life. Ибо так возлюбил Бог мир, что отдал сына своего единородного, дабы всякий, верующий в него, не погиб, но имел жизнь вечную. Thank you, Father, for this day. Uh, we bless this day to your service, and we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Betsy.